From Advisory Board, we're bringing you a radio advisory. My name is Rachel Woods. You can call me Ray. Earlier this month, we released an episode on why racism is a healthcare issue. Today, I want to continue that conversation by focusing specifically on health equity and the impact that racism has on health outcomes. To do that, I've brought two voices to Radio Advisory, Chief Health Equity Officer for United Health Group, Mike Curie, and the leader of social responsibility for Optum, Graham McLaughlin. Hey, Mike. Hey, Graham. Hello. Hey, thanks for having us. Mike, where are you dialing into the podcast from? I'm here at Command Central here in my house in Western Howard County, Maryland. Graham, how about you? I'm dialing in from D.C., just down the road from Mike. Interesting. I'm in the suburbs of D.C., too, on the Virginia side. So in normal circumstances, we perhaps would all be together. But I appreciate each of you for dialing in remotely for this. I want to give you a moment to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit more about you and your role. Graham, let's start with you. I lead social responsibility at Optum, as you mentioned, and that's really thinking about how do we deploy all of our assets, capabilities, and scale as an organization that supports the holistic services of healthcare. And so when we looked at the whole gamut of healthcare, we decided to focus on health equity as the focus area of Optum Social Responsibility. And exactly why you're a good voice to have on this episode. Mike, tell us a little bit more about you and your role. I am the Chief Health Equity Officer at United Health Group. I really get the fortunate privilege of being able to help work with and guide leaders across the organization and all of our lines of business, really around two main things. One, the identification of health disparities and gaps in care and utilization and outcomes down to a population level. And then once identified, because it's never a matter of if they exist, it's where and to what order of magnitude they exist. Once identified, then the strategies, programs, services, solutions to address those identified disparities. Well, let's get right into it. I'm sure both of you have seen across the last few weeks There have been a lot of healthcare organizations who've published statements, those that are condemning structural racism, condemning police brutality, all in the name of improving health equity. Mike, what do we actually mean when we talk about health equity? Ray, what we're talking about is being able to respond to and provide based on the unique needs of the individuals. If you think about three individuals, one is a tall man, 6'4", one is a woman who's about 5'8", and one is a child that's four feet tall. If the goal is to make sure that everyone has a bicycle, equality is making sure that everyone has a bike. It's not a bike that is tailored to their unique sizes and capabilities, it's just a bike. Equity implies and means that you provide a bike that is specific and unique to the needs of that individual. So we know that healthcare companies all tell us they're interested in reducing health disparities, but I'm wondering how that compares to their actual actions, right? The things that they do day to day to actually reduce those disparities. Graham, can you tell me where most health systems actually are and perhaps where they start when they're talking about improving health equity? Yeah, usually the journey is threefold. The first is our direct care. How do we think about closing that empathy gap and addressing unconscious bias? And so really training on cultural competency, unconscious bias, education, et cetera. Secondly is how do we then move to broaden our community benefit efforts, not just charity care, but really thinking about expansion to community programs? And then thirdly, how do we fully integrate strategy, both switching from fee-for-service to a broader payment model but also thinking about how do we drive community impact. I think that's right. Let's just do some more level setting. Mike, where do you see the impact of structural racism? Health conditions, health status, access and utilization patterns, where access is based on quality providers to various communities, especially when we talk about communities of color. So where you live is important. 
The safety of where you live is important. Access to quality of care is important. And all of those, every single one of those and 15 other different aspects all relate back to a history of racism that structurally still exists today, whether it's unconscious or conscious. And it's everything from failing schools and food deserts and unaffordable housing to actual inadequate health services that ultimately results in a much shorter lifespan for Black people when we compare that to their white counterparts. Sure. And I think that's just important to recognize. I think there's an unfortunate and false stereotype among white people that the difference in life expectancy when we look at Black communities comes from things like gangs and, and, and gun violence. But what you're saying is that that's not the case. It's twofold. So there's accountability within the Black community as well. Are there things that we can, should, and will do to improve the safety of our communities and do better amongst ourselves? Absolutely. You could say that about every single race or ethnicity or age group or gender group. That's pretty universal. But what we're talking about here is the playing field being level, and that's where racism Uh, And structural racism, historical racism, and even current racism has a stake in what you see based on where people live. You touched on many of them, what education looks like in some communities, what the safety is like in some communities, where access to care is in some communities, what nutritious food is available in some communities. All of that is rooted in a history and past. And the piece to touch on, you know, the past We need to learn from the past so we can be better in the future. But what we also want to do is we want to be able to have a candid enough discussion so that people cannot be paralyzed uh, by inaction and move towards a common solution. And those solutions are going to be there. Now, I wonder, have either of you come across a healthcare leader that just pushes back on this concept? Perhaps they understand that the social determinants impact health but maybe they push back on the role of the hospital or the role of medical care, especially when it comes to things like schools and food deserts and safety out in the streets. Do you actually hear that pushback? And what do you say when it comes up? I think there's two pieces of pushback sometimes you hear. One is how broad does our mission have to be? What we're talking about are not necessarily just the problems of a health system. And then secondly, how do we align to ROI? So on the first one, a good example is Rush. They actually changed their mission from being the best in patient care to improving health. There was a 16-year gap in life expectancy between folks who are a couple miles away in their jurisdiction. So they said, we're going to be an anchor institution. We're going to think about how we hire differently, how we spend differently, how we really support the ecosystem of health in our community. And so it's not about just when people come through our doors, but it's us thinking more broadly about the, the way that we are an anchor in the community. Mike, do you hear the pushback of, this isn't my job, and, and how do you react to it? So, you know, Ray, I don't know that I would necessarily call it pushback. What I would categorize it as is a sense of awkwardness and discomfort. And that discomfort is associated with really three main things. Graham touched on one, money and return on investment. Two, I don't want to be the only one doing this. So is there a groundswell of other leaders like me trying to do something or am I on an island all by myself? There's a discomfort to be out there and perceived as by yourself. And then authenticity. Do I really believe that this is the best thing to do or am I just kind of going along to get along? You really have to be aware of all of those when working with whomever the leaders are to figure out where you think they are and where they might even say they are, and then try to figure out solutions based on what the reality is. I want to dive headfirst into this concept of the business goal and ROI, because I think that this is actually a big reason why healthcare leaders have either avoided truly investing in health equity, or it's just fallen to the bottom of their to-do list. Allow me to just channel the voice of a particular healthcare executive for a moment. We know that healthcare leaders are all juggling dozens of priorities. 
And that was true, by the way, before we had a, a pandemic knocking at our doors. So let's say I'm that busy healthcare executive. I've got slim margins at my organization. Why should I prioritize health equity over all my other initiatives, particularly those with a clearer short-term ROI? Graham, I'll, I'll jump in and just say three quick things, and please feel free to expand on these. The three quick things are profit. When you focus on health equity, there are better outcomes. There's opportunity to get bonus pay or performance pay in different contracts. Number two, there are improved health outcomes. And as a healthcare industry leader, you always want to be able to stand on your outcomes performance that differentiates you from everyone else. And then last but not least is the brand recognition and the industry recognition that goes along with being the best, because that leads to both retention and growth of customers and clients. Graham, what are you hearing when it comes to the more direct revenue boost that might come from a focus on health equity? Let me give you one example. A nonprofit partner came to us, Children's Law Center, and they were hearing from so many of their families in public housing that children in these families were going to the ED constantly on asthma flare-ups. They realized the issue was that there was mold and other environmental degradation in the housing, and they wanted to invest in being able to enhance that housing, but they didn't have the funding. They actually ended up partnering with Children's National in building out a financial sustainability model that allows them to do this work at scale, because what Children's National and Children's Law Center realized was that by Children's National investing in the housing remediation work, they saved millions of dollars in these young kids coming into the hospital with asthma flare-ups because they no longer had these environmental challenges in their housing, speaking to Mike's point about sort of structural racism and housing having these reverberation effects. So that's just one example of many where these upstream interventions can actually have pretty significant downstream cost savings. We'll be right back with more radio advisory after this short break. Hi, I'm Chris with the Radio Advisory Team. On behalf of everyone at Advisory Board, thank you for everything you're doing to battle COVID-19. We want to help you celebrate the bright spots. Perhaps you've been amazed at how your teams, your peers, or your leaders are supporting you. Or perhaps a patient's words reminded you of why you do what you do. What bright spots are you seeing? We want to hear from you. Share your story at advisory.com slash thank you and view our message of thanks. I'm going to keep my hat on as this curmudgeon physician executive. What if I operate an organization that just doesn't have a lot of revenue at risk? I'm still largely in fee for service and I make my margin slim as it may be on pretty traditional services and procedures in the hospital, like orthopedic surgery, et cetera. What do you say to those folks? Ray, that gets into the authenticity. And it's really all about the value proposition. So if your value proposition is to generate revenue, then it, there really is nothing that is going to compel you to make any sort of substantial, significant, meaningful, sustainable change. It really doesn't mm -hmm. matter. But if your value proposition in this space of health and health equity is around helping people live healthier lives and helping people to be as healthy as possible, then there is no amount of anything that you could evaluate that doesn't suggest that leveraging pillars of health equity, outreaching and engaging in a tailored way, making sure that care is accessible and of quality for all, isn't at the core of how you deliver your care and your business of care delivery. And I think this is really a reckoning moment for a lot of leaders who are having their authenticity challenged right now, particularly, as I said, as they're, they're putting out these statements that are aimed at reducing structural racism and improving outcomes and improving health equity. Let's say you're an organization that's at that 1.0 that Graham suggested. You're just beginning. You now know how much you need to invest in this. Where should you actually begin? It all starts with the data. You can't manage what you don't measure. 
So for any organization, big or small, the first thing you want to do is gather your information so that it can be stratified. So where your disparities of those gaps are identifiable. And then you can begin the hard work of figuring out what to do, how to do, when to do. Yeah, building on Mike's point of do no harm, if you will, first, how do you ensure that you are creating a place that has equitable experiences and outcomes? How do you have culturally competent care? How do you ensure you mitigate unconscious bias? And to Mike's point, how do you disaggregate your data to know if you are providing that type of care? But then I think secondly, organizations have to determine, again, going back to Mike's point and going to Russia's change in mission, are you there to provide great care or are you there to enhance health? And then it's really thinking about every asset at your disposal, how you hire, where you place a hospital, how you think about your spend, et cetera, in order to really enhance health of communities. I want to ask the same question, but maybe to the 2.0 or 3.0 institutions. So the ones who've made a lot of investments, maybe consider themselves an anchor institution in the community. What advice would you give to them as they're thinking about turning up their efforts even more in the wake of the things that are happening right now? Make others come along with you. The challenge, as we have outlined, is financial sustainability. But so many times, providers are the ones who have had to bear the burden of this financial sustainability. So how do you partner with government on social impact bonds for the work that you're doing? How do you build that collective impact model with local businesses? This is really hard, but it's going to take leaders and as anchor institutions and communities and those with a calling beyond commerce. How do you really take that lead in bringing those along with you? I totally ditto that. And I will echo it with a sentence. Demonstrate, benefit, and then compel others to act. I'm wondering if you can give a little bit of lip service to those who are worried about all the ways that this could go wrong, right? We talked about authenticity as being something that's important. Uh, And in our last episode, we had a couple of messages specifically targeted to white leaders who are feeling uncomfortable about this moment. I want to ask the same question to both of you. What message would you give to white leadership that is struggling with creating authentic solutions to improving health equity? So, you know, as as a Black man who has been involved in population health um, professionally for 20 plus years, I would offer to all leaders, especially white leaders, to number one, leverage resources to learn, whether it's books, podcasts like this, whatever your thing is, leverage some resources so that you get not an expert understanding, but a better understanding of how we got to this place and what some of the feeling and sentiment is of those that are in this place. And then secondly, seek out support from those in your leadership who have a genuine and authentic understanding of what's going on and include them in the decision-making process on how you're going to address whatever it is you're going to identify on a go-forward basis. Graham, what advice would you give to white leaders who are wondering how this could go wrong? I would take the words of Audre Lorde, who I I think even today, 40 or so years later, still resonate on if the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, then how, as leaders, are you thinking about how you stop worrying about the risk, how you stop thinking about this is how we've done it, and things might not go exactly according to plan, and there may be challenges and there may be problems, but if you, if we as leaders aren't willing to take the risk and bear some of that, you know, sacrifice, if you will, I don't think there's ever going to be equity or equality. And so, you know, how do you take that first step and meet more than halfway in order to be able to really be the driver of equity that is needed? Hey, Ray, if I may, can I just add another sentence on that? Absolutely. Obviously, there is a level of accountability and the buck stopping with the leaders and CEOs and COOs of organizations. But I'm going to add another layer of accountability. And that layer of accountability, especially when we talk about 
medium to large to mega size organizations, I'm going to put it at the feet of the board of directors. Hmm. Because if boards of directors begin to demand that health equity and inclusion are part of the performance metrics of an organization, watch how quickly it becomes part of mainstream. We've talked about a couple of issues that matter a lot to healthcare executives, right? We've talked about what this means for revenue, what it means for patient outcomes, what it means for things like brand recognition and patient satisfaction. What we haven't really talked about yet is what a focus on health equity actually does for providers and staff. All providers, as part of their oath, want to do no harm and provide the best care possible. That's why they go into the profession. But we all also have biases, implicit biases that just go along with our life experiences and makeup. That doesn't mean they're wrong or they're right. It's just part of who we are. So being able to understand that and provide education, however an institution chooses to provide that education, online, in person, with through grand rounds, we'll leave it up to them to really do that in a meaningful way, but to provide education and information, awareness, and skill building around controlling for implicit bias so that uh, as individuals continue to treat the increasingly diverse patients that come before them, they are able and equipped to do their best job and do their best work. Mike, maybe I'm just feeling like a pessimist today, but I can imagine that that is hard in any situation, let alone in a pandemic when your volumes are low and when patients are meeting with their providers via telemedicine and it's difficult enough to have an interaction virtually, let alone one that's in person. What advice would you give to boots on the ground provider leaders that are struggling with changing provider behavior at all, even right now in the middle of a pandemic? Ray, that's where the training is just critically important. And when I'm talking about training, I'm not talking about check the box training that gets done in June and then you don't revisit it again for another year or another two years. It's a series of trainings. And I wouldn't suggest that you make them mandatory because you want people, especially clinicians and providers that are in the business of trying to keep people healthy, you want them to feel compelled to want to do this because it's for the good of the patients uh, and members that they serve. Uh, But providing a series of educational models and trainings to help bring people's awareness as well as skill and capacity along. And Ray, you talked a while ago about in a challenging financial environment where you you know you got to be doing as many shoulders et cetera as you can let's also not forget that a significant portion of the population are individuals who have been negatively impacted by structural racism and you know these these care gaps and so when the 35 year old black stockbroker who on the weekends is a weekend warrior and needs his shoulder replaced cuz he had an injury how How's he going to choose his provider to do that? Well, if his mother was given culturally competent, high quality care, that's one thing to think about. And it's actually going to drive revenue to your hospital as well. Great point. Graham, Mike, I want to thank both of you for coming on Radio Advisory. And I want to give each of you just a couple of moments at the end here to offer advice directly to healthcare leaders that are struggling in this moment. Graham, let's start with you. What advice would you give to healthcare leaders right now? I don't know if I have advice, but I would say it's an incredibly challenging environment from a revenue perspective, from a this moment in time as disparities continue to be laid bare. And while every stakeholder you have is pushing for action, I think this is a moment to lead and a moment to take quote unquote risk in really pushing an equity agenda, both upward to your board and to your staff, to your colleagues, and to your consumers. Mike, how about you? Ray, the time is now. I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's awkward. And in some ways, it's just flat out difficult and hard. But it, it's the right thing to do for those that you serve and those that you provide care to. It's the right thing to do for your employees and the industry as a whole. It's the right thing to do for the bottom line. 
and it's the right thing to do for the society as a whole. So the time is now and just leave. Way to uh, drop the mic on that last one. Graham, Mike, thanks so much for coming on Radio Advisory. We'll have to have you back. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Graham. Thanks for having us. Over the last several weeks, we've seen quite a few healthcare companies put out statements on reducing structural racism. It's not enough just to talk the talk. You can't publish a statement and then do nothing. Leaders must take an authentic approach to reducing health disparities. It starts in your leadership and with your board and extends all the way down into bedside care delivery for all of your providers. This is hard work, but as always, we're here to help. Amazing. Did you just, was that just on the top of your head? Is that from something? Uh, I just riffed. I just riffed. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Very impressive.